I'm due to give a talk down in London later this month on central bank digital currency, part of some uh, seminar group on that. And having prepared a talk on it, I thought I might as well release a video based on the talk I was going to give. So I'm focusing on the historical process leading up to central bank digital coins. We know that the first farming communities, first Neolithic farming communities in Northern Europe lived relatively commonly. We know this from the type of houses they built. They were long houses and we know that contemporary societies or recent societies that have had those long houses lived relatively commonly. And we presume that they work collectively. And by their collective work, they were able to construct monuments of increasing size and complexity. This is above Tarland. This is in the Orkneys, Hebrides. And obviously doing this required the allocation of large amounts of surplus labour to what was perceived as the common good. As the communities got larger, the monuments got larger, and it's inferred that chieftainship and then kingship arose as an institution commanding such collective effort. That is inference, because we don't get the first actual records of kingship until shortly before the current era. Of course, in other parts of the world, the records go back further. And kings are the, or were, the alienated personification of collective effort. That's because the king had the time, the power to command the time of his subjects. At the least, they could be made to serve in time of war and in time of peace, they could be instructed to devote their time to collective projects. I say alienated because the king's person becomes the representative of this collective power. And people speak of the king as building the monuments. So you have the Pyramid of Cheops, you have Hadrian's Wall, despite the fact that neither Cheops nor Hadrian laid the bricks. Under the feudal system, you then get a delegation of power in a social pyramid. The crown delegates command over social labour to state officials. These would be called counts, barons, etc. And these state officials appropriated the labour of local farmers and in the process the local farmers were reduced to serfs and in return for which the crown was provided with armies and a nominal upkeep of roads etc. This process led however to the magnates becoming a threat to royal power what had been a delegation of authority to collect rent in order to maintain armies became essentially private property of the aristocratic cl uh, class who became a class of landowners. Now this is at a time when the labour was provided directly by the serfs. Now Adam Smith said that money is the power to command the labour of others, or is a power to command the labour of others. If you've got money, you can command a plumber to fix your bath taps. If a firm has mummy, money, it can command employees to do whatever it wants. And if the king has money, he could command armies. But that only became necessary once labour rents were commuted into money rents. 
absolute monarchies establish themselves against the feudal power once an economy based on coin was in, in existence. The Crown commuted labour services and imposed a duty to levy a duty to pay tax in royal coin. It issues coin to pay its own troops. In Britain they issued stocks or sticks to buy weapons and ships and it then imposes a duty to pay tax in the royal coin or which can also be settled with half stocks. I'll show you them in a moment. Now with its own paid army the crown power becomes supreme and is over able to overcome the power of the feudal magnates. When I say stocks I'm talking about the tally sticks. Um, the crown typically purchased many supplies by issuing tally sticks which have numbers written on them and then they're split down the middle. Uh, the exchequer retains half of that. The merchant who has supplied say the gunpowder to the to the king gets the other half and the merchant can exchange these on the market for other goods because the exchequer will accept half of a stock in lieu of taxes, in lieu of settlement of tax debts. And these half sticks could and did circulate as money. Forgery was prevented since acceptance by the exchequer would only take place if the half stick being handed in or the stock exactly matched its sister held in the exchequer and the splitting of the wood provided an anti-forgery device. An alternative anti-forgery device is to issue your money made out of something that's very expensive to make. And the Crown could also issue coin to, to purchase ships. Uh, it then extracts money taxes to get the coins back again. Uh, since only the royal coin would be accepted in taxes. Now a royal coin and a royal badge are in a sense the same thing. With a coin the crown delegates authority to the person who has the coin. If the crown makes someone an officer a crown badge is created and delegates royal authority to the officer. It is the same process in a sense it's the same process as occurred in creating the feudal nobility except it becomes entirely symbolic and portable. Wh whoever carries the, the emblem of authority, whoever carries the coin has the authority. In the feudal form of usurpation the delegation establish an exploiting landed aristocracy and monetary delegation established an exploiting plutocracy. Great banks and other financial institutions are the modern equivalent of the magnates of the 14th century. Coin now has largely been replaced by bank cards. Money has by that been privatised in the same way as feudal tenure transported itself or translated itself into the private property of the landlord class. Well once the crown, an alienated personification of communal labour, issued money, now private banks created. In the process they abrogate to themselves command over most of social labour. So to understand what's happening here you have to look at what's called seigneurage and it is state revenue coming from issuing money with a face value exceeding its gold or silver value. Obviously in the case of paper money the entire value of it exceeds the paper. And all creation of Bank of England money 
whether it is paper notes or deposit accounts at the Bank of England constitutes seigneurage. It constitutes a form of uh, revenue of the seigneur of the crown since the central bank is crown property. How does it work? Well, the government pays a person or a company with a draft that looks like a cheque, except it's not really a cheque because it's not drawn on a bank. It's drawn on a royal officer. If you see, instead of the bank of uh, Lloyd's Bank or Barclays Bank being on whom it's drawn, it says draw, it's drawn on the King's Remembrancer, and that's currently a woman called Barbara Jane Fontaine. And if you look at the optical character recognition numbers on the draft, you find that the King's Remembrancer actually corresponds to an account at the Bank of England. Suppose the Navy purchases a new ship. Now this is a real appropriation of national wealth by the Crown. Real national, uh, real labour, real materials went into producing this, this ship. So this is an appropriation of a surplus product by the Crown when the ship is handed over to them. In return, the shipyard, and that's HMS Tamar, which is the last ship commissioned by the Royal Navy, and that is the Govan Yard in Glasgow, which built it. The Govan Yard received payment of £247 million for that in the form of a draft drawn on the King's Remembrancer. With that draft, the Govan Shipyard could present the draft to its local bank, the Bank of Scotland, as if it were a cheque. And it gets its account credited. Bank of Scotland in turn presents the draft to the Bank of England and BAC Govan's account at the Bank of Scotland uh, is credited with 247 million and the account of the Bank of Scotland at the Bank of England is credited with 247 million. Now this is a purely symbolic operation the real appropriation of surplus has already taken place. It took place when the ship was handed over. BAC Govan can then pay its workers. And since it's in Scotland, it can pay its workers in private banknotes issued by the Bank of Scotland, which these then circulate as money. If it was in England, and it was banking with Barclays, it could credit their account at Barclays. So what's happened here? The crown economy has appropriated a ship. In the private economy, we have private money has now circulating. The crown's appropriated real wealth. It's created notional liabilities at the Bank of England, but these aren't real liabilities. Because unlike any private agent, the Crown can create offsetting tax liabilities on the civil economy. So when treating issued money as a liability of the Crown, it's not really a liability. It is just a means by which the civil economy can offset the liabilities the, tax, the Crown imposes on it. But private bank money is now circulating in the civil economy. I show notes because that's what happens in Scotland, but in practice it would be bank debit cards. And the private banks now have reserves with the Bank of England. And with this, with these reserves, they can issue several times more in private money than the Crown created in royal money. 
Now let's look at the scale of this seigneurage. In February 2021, outstanding deposits at the Bank of England stood at just under £930 billion, pounds, of which £803 billion was held by private banks. Some was held by banks overseas, etc. And this is a measure of the resources the state or the crown had appropriated from the civil economy without any explicit taxation. It means up until 2021, the crown had appropriated 930 billion without explicit taxation. And if you look at the civil seigneurage that's going on at the same time, this is roughly four times as great. If you take one of the, the big banks like Lloyd's, it had 91 billion of those uh, 930 billion that were deposited at the uh, Bank of England. But from this, Lloyd's had created 475 billion in civil bank deposits. And these civil bank deposits function actually as money. And at the same time, on 91 billion deposited at the Bank of England, 91 billion created by the Crown, fed through the private banking system and appearing as deposits held by the private banks, Lloyd's was able to advance over 500 billion in loans on which it then creates interest, charges interest. So look at the old and new appropriators. With feudal delegated authority, you establish a rentier class and the bulk of the population paid them direct labour rent. With the current financial system, you have a delegated system of seigneurage. And the banks, via both mortgage lending and personal credit card lending and lending to companies, put themselves into a position where they extract disguised rent from the bulk of the population. People may think that they own a house, but if they have a mortgage on it, that mortgage payment is a disguised form of rent going to the banks. Now, how does this change with central bank digital currency? If the Bank of England creates its own digital currency. I'm assuming that any firm with a government contract is going to have a direct Bank of England account into which their payments for delivering goods to the Crown will be made. Most citizens, especially those getting benefits, will also have Bank of England accounts into which the benefits are paid. And I'm assuming that the existing infrastructure of debit cards will work against debit cards issued by the Bank of England. And many workers, even those who are not in receipt of benefits, are likely to elect to have their wages paid into a Bank of England account. Now, what effect will this have? When the Crown creates money, it will no longer appear as deposits by private banks at the Bank of England, unless someone individually or a firm individually decides to transfer their Bank of England deposit to a Lloyd's deposit or a Barclays deposit. So only part of the newly created money will come under the control of private banks. And the effect of this is that civil seigneurage is going to be markedly reduced. It won't affect money which already exists unless people decide to withdraw cash from private banks and transfer it to the, to the Bank of England. This implies a change in the balance of forces within the upper classes. 
you will get a strengthening of state versus private finance. And in, to my mind, this is analogous to the way the Tudor monarchs strengthened central state power at the expense of the landed magnates. It may produce a slowdown of financialization of the economy, since the rate of growth of the monetary base held by the private banks will slow down. And in a way, that will make it analogous to the period from 1945 to 1970, when the power of finance capital was relatively weaker. In that case, it had been because so many overseas financial assets had been requisitioned by the state during the war. And this will tend to make industrial capital relatively more important and influential compared to the banks. It's possible it'll lead to less house price inflation. There'll be less credit flowing into the housing market. And a consequence of that may be that the share of national income going as rent will fall. Now, people object that if you get the gradual replacement of coins and notes by central bank digital currency, the Crown will get greater control over what's done. Well, at the moment, the only people who make large use of cash are either people engaged in criminal activities, drug smuggling, people trafficking, or people evading taxes at a petty scale taking payment in cash so as not to um, pay VAT or not to pay uh, income tax. Now, the elimination of or making it harder for drug dealers or making it harder for people to, to, to evade paying taxes doesn't seem to me to be a big issue that one should get worried about. On the other hand, it doesn't act, obviously change the basic structure of the economy still a private capitalist economy. On the other hand, it does create the infrastructure which at times of a future crisis could allow what were once described as despotic inroads on private property. If there was another financial crisis like that in 2010, and the basic reason why you have these crises is this ratio of real state money to private money, that the private banks have multiples of, what, of obligations in the form of private money compared to the reserves they have in state money. So there's always the possibility of a run on the banks which could never be met. Last time that happened, the banks were described as being too big to fail. If the big clearing banks had gone down because they were insolvent, then the ability to make payments and to carry out the civil economy would have collapsed, since the civil economy was supported by transactions in private bank money. If there is a repeat of the sort of financial crisis that there was, was in 2010, which of course is always possible in a financialized economy, if there's such a repeat of such a crisis, then it would no longer be the case that the private banks were too big to fail. It would no longer be the case that the state would have to step in and bail them out as they did in 2010, because the crown banking system would exist in parallel. It wouldn't matter so much if Lloyd's went down the tubes.
or the Royal Bank of Scotland went down the tubes because people would still have Bank of England accounts, businesses would have Bank of England accounts and transactions could still proceed. The people who held money, particularly people who held large sums of money with the collapsing bank would lose. But it's not necessarily the responsibility of the state to maintain losses which arise through the overextension of credit by the private banks. So that's a loose account of what I think could happen. 